Last but not least, I would like to invite up here a very special person, Noor Hanim Kairudi. To, she will be reading excerpts from the commentaries, right? The commentaries of the artists who have written for the magazine for which she is the editor of. Ladies and gentlemen, let, let's give Noor Hanim a big hand. Assalamu alaikum and uh, thank you for being here. I think it's okay. Uh, let me just take this opportunity first to thank the organizer, especially Pak Peter, for <laughs> making me part of this very exciting program. Uh, actually, this is going to be my first time reading, literally reading from an article for the public. Um, so today, uh, I won't be reading my own writing, unfortunately, because it's going to be really boring. But instead, I'm going to read uh, a quite nice um, uh, text writing by Hasnul Jama Saidon, who is an artist, uh, curator, and also a very respected academician in uh, USM Kinang, at the School of Art. So uh, his Article uh, was published in um, Sentap, the book which I co edit, um, end of last year. Uh, and in this article, uh, Hasno uh, is kind of reminiscing about uh, his or most of the artist guru by the name of Ismail Zain, the late Ismail Zain. Yeah? Um, he was an influential artist, thinker, and educator and uh, has had a profound impact on subsequent generations in the Malaysian art scene. So I will read uh, Hasnol's uh, article, Mengadap Guru Lagi, or in English, Facing a Guru Again. Some of us have their phantom of the opera, some the phantom menace, while some others the phantom. I have my Phantom F4. Yes, earlier I have distributed, maybe some of you have seen. There is a work by Ismail Zain uh, entitled The Phantom F4. Yeah? So this writing is actually inspired by this work. Ismail Zain used to be one of my lecturers or guru during my final year drawing class at UITM in 1988. Well, actually, he was a guest lecturer, brought in by Fauzan Omar, who was then the head of fine art program. His drawing class for me was a master class. Yeah, I know I'm bragging. But one can always cross-check my sentiment with his other ex-students, who were blessed to be in his drawing class back then. I have to note here that my encounters with him even went beyond the classroom including hanging out and sleeping over at his house to see his digital and wet studio, serving as one of his minions to construct his digitally designed set for Nordin Hassan's play Chindai, or just playing the role of wheeling punching bags for his witty and intelligent jabs, thrown to wake, tease and make our lazy brains work a bit mostly at centre stage performing arts in a rented bungalow at Bangsa. Ismail Zain has stirred and opened up several special parts within my own neural internet, a gift that I will cherish forever. <coughs> he had left a massive lingering impact towards my own personal growth. I hope I can leave similar impact to my students, but sadly I doubt it. Most have probably been frightened by my incomprehensible quantum ramblings and they ran away. For now, let's focus on one of his digital collages, my favorite, Phantom F4, medium dot matrix print on paper and produced in 1988. I'm recalling a special lecture he gave on his then new series of digital collages back in 1988 at the School of Art and Design UITM. It was only for his final year drawing class students. He was visibly excited to share, not unlike a small kid, I guess, 
Yet we were naively dumbfounded about his small A4 size prints. What's so special? Most of us thought they were etchings. Nothing really significant. In his own Kedahan way, he teased us with semiotics, structuralism, post-structuralism, global village, medium is the message, Marshall McLohan and other big names with fancy theories and terms. Of course, we just, oh, ah, hmm, okay, okay, right, right, punctuated by occasional, wow, to please him. The closest to any post for us then was post opis. Um, the fastest was post laju. And most of us thought that he was referring to genes when he mentioned Strauss, the structural anthropologist. Yet he was cool, even able to deploy his usual kadahan wittiness to bring his high end theories into a common sense, everyday understanding. I'll try to emulate that here. Back in 1988, Ismail Zain, like a tukang tili or seer, was already able to foresee the incoming waves and consequences of globalization brought about by information implosion. He was responding to how such implosion, such interconnectivity, or simply such massive influx of information exchange may bombard our collective consciousness, our brain, or our mind. Our tastes, our sentiments, our values, our realities and sense of identities may not be naively mono anymore, but more likely a collage, mental and emotional collages. The amalgamation of tastes, of sentiments, values, realities and identities may reside, coexist side by side or become hybrid, hybridized in many odd combinations within our collective consciousness. Some may even contradict each other, having no logical relationship whatsoever, as epitomized or shown through his work above. Ismail even deployed Malay Pantun, or rhymes, to explain how the combination of unrelated images were then becoming more and more common in the mediascape. He used the unrelated combination between pembayang maksud, which means bearer of meaning, and maksud, meaning, in Malay Pantun as an example of collage practice. That's typical of Ismail Zain, who could make a synapse leap from one source to another like no one's business. Such odd combination was referred to as juxtaposition, a term used by another Mahaguru, Krishanjit. He used it to explain Ismail's juxtaposition of unrelated images, each with its own already given meaning, but unveil new readings when placed together or juxtaposed. The practice is usually referred to by heavy-headed theorists as intertextuality of textual materials, taken or appropriated from diverse open sources to be juxtaposed together to create new things. Imagine, back then before Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, us flipping between two concurrent TV channels. One, a National Geographic documentary on fighter jets. Another, a local RTM news coverage on the plight of local kampung farmers surviving in the global market. Two different languages, ways of explaining, of talking about, of communicating, and making meanings or senses or discourse to sound smart and hip, coexist on air or on our mediascape. If we flip fast and many times, both may converge in our minds or consciousness. We may find ourselves conversing in two discourses concurrently, like talking to an engineer or fighter jets about their weaponry systems whilst conversing with a few local farmers about their temulawa, terong, chili, bende, petai, jering, etc. As we are listing MK84 GP bomb for the jet, we are also seeing a terong, the eggplant. The combination between these two sets of textual materials, each with its own discourse and discursive logic, creates a hybrid discourse, surreal, comical, 
or odd it may be. Our collective consciousness may not be in harmony all the time anymore, but conflicting and contradictory, full with paradoxes and ironies. Okay, last page. Of course, sometimes we may feel as if our collective mind is in conflict with itself, attacking its own conscience. Today, in some instances, we have witnessed how such confluence of conflicting readings and interpretations has surfaced or been highlighted in the social media. We even serve in a highly dense conflicting information landscape full of reactions towards reactions to other reactions, perhaps like a chain reaction in a nuclear fusion. Few would hypothesize that Ismail was also making a veiled statement about neo-imperialism or the might of advanced weaponries and war technologies of global superpowers. USA is the main culprit, of course. As an extension of power and instrument of global domination against weaker countries who rely heavily on their poor agricultural-based economy. Personally, knowing Pak Ma'il, I don't think he was interested in purposely making a political statement or commentary, not to mention one that de desperately seeking attention to itself to induce political awareness or mobilization. He was too much a thinker to commit such endeavor. But I might be wrong here. Don't take my reading here literally. Phantom F4, for me, is an epitome of Ismail's witness in anticipating and reading the imperatives and inevitable outcomes of globalization and information implosion way ahead of his peers. So there you go, my little reflection on Ismail Zain's Phantom F4. I hope we have gained some sensible insights on him from this reflection. If not, blame it on me and just throw this aside. As a Muslim, I send Pak Ma'il my doa in Al-Fatiha. Rest in peace, my dear Guru. Thank you. Thank you, Hanim, for sharing with us the critique and review of one of our most notable artists in Malaysia, who unfortunately have passed away. Thank you very much.